Welcome to the REI Diamonds Show with Dan Breslin, your source for real estate investment jewels of wisdom. Welcome to the REI Diamond Show, the show dedicated to discovering the jewels of wisdom used for increasing ROI for REIs. That is return on investment for real estate investors. I'm your host, Dan Breslin, and this is episode 104 with Dan Clarton on making more money from less deals. Dan and I met a few years ago at the Chicago Ring Meeting, that's Real Estate Investor Networking Group meeting we host here in the Chicago suburb of Schaumburg, Illinois. At that networking event, I get to meet a lot of people who are in their first few years, if not right at the beginning of their real estate investing career. And many of those people who come to those events have maybe done a few deals or no deals at all, but often when I see them a few years later, they've given up on real estate and moved on. Dan's story is different, though, and that's the reason that I invited him to come on today's show. Dan has built his real estate business, you know, from a standstill to a multi six figure per year income for himself, replacing his corporate job and giving him the freedom from the nine to five that so many people seek when they first get started in real estate. And now his story is laced with focus, which is one of the key ingredients in any success. Like myself, early on, Dan struggled with the shiny object syndrome, bouncing from idea to idea on how to make money in real estate, you know, attending the webinars on lease options, then the webinars on wholesaling, then the webinars on Airbnb, then, you know, maybe I should buy rental properties before figuring out the number one skill to consistently make money in real estate, and that is buying real estate at the right price. I know once I figured out that piece, the door to financial freedom was wide open. We'll jump right in, shall we? Welcome to the show, Mr. Dan Clarton. How are you doing this morning? Very well, sir. Thanks for having me. For for those that don't know, Dan, Dan's a local Illinois guy here out in the suburbs of uh, of Chicago. So I'm recording from Chicago, and you are also recording from right outside Chicago, right, Dan? Yes, sir. Right out in the uh, far-reaching burbs. And it's uh, it's June 11th. How wonderful is our weather today, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this year has been one of those years, um, but every day we get up and uh, breathe fresh air and have another chance to go after it uh, is a good day the way I see it. But some days uh, are just a little nicer uh, weather-wise than others. <laughs> Look at the good news. We don't have four inches of snow today. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's always something to complain about, or I guess to look at the positive side of the coin. So, Dan, for listeners around the country who don't know already who you are, I know you're kind of a a name here in the in the investor community and the Chicago market. But for those that don't know you yet, how did you get started in real estate, and then what does your business look like today in real estate? Sure. I mean, I think like uh, like a lot of people, you know, I kind of got. Uh, wooed in uh, myself. I, I don't normally hear people go this route, but some years ago uh, down at the United Center where the uh, Chicago Bulls and the Blackhawks play, they had a giant uh, get motivated kind of seminar, and they brought in the likes of Rudy Giuliani and Terry Bradshaw, and you know they brought in some big names, and then intertwined between that, they had people pitching real estate and and stock and you know some other kind of things you could learn about. And at the time, I had a, you know, full-time, uh, you know, kind of corporate kind of job, if you will. But I always kind of had an entrepreneurial side to me because I started a, a side business many years ago of running ATM machines. And it's amazing how that business really kind of parallels uh, the real estate business, uh, specifically from the, the rental aspect. So I'm always a big proponent of the best time to start Plan B is while plan A is still paying the bills. So my wife, uh, you know, at the time had about an 18-year run where she stayed home to raise kids. And so I was, you know, scrambling to, you know, try to make a living for the family and always, you know, kind of keeping my eye open. And this real estate thing kind of intrigued me. But I got to tell you, 
I'm not one of these people that, oh, I've always loved real estate and all that kind of stuff. It just, I think it just made sense to me. And so, uh, you know, spent a bunch of money and went to some boot camps and, and did a lot of that stuff. And, uh, you know, but really wasn't, you know, wholly committed to it because again, I had a, I had a good paying job. I did a lot of business travel. So my availability, uh, to do a lot of this stuff wasn't that good. Um, but I did buy the first properties that I did not live in in 2011. And then, you know, how I just said I didn't really have a lot of time to uh, pursue this. Well, uh, God took care of that because the startup company that I went to work for in 1998 and helped start at zero and build into something big, you know, like any business you have, like kind of like a sports team, right? So you have different layers of leadership and and stuff that, you know, take it from the ground to here and then take it from here, let's grow it, and then let's grow it, make it big. And somewhere along the way, I'd survived all the, uh, you know, highest level management changes. But at some point, uh, you know, in business, there's only two ways to make money. Either you got to make more or spend less. And the company was getting to a point where they couldn't figure out how to make more. So it became easy to, well, let's take a look at some of the big salaries we probably can do without. And uh, I hit the list. So it's starting in 2012, I started to have a lot of free time on my hands. <laughs> nice. So I think, you know, what in the beginning, I, I didn't have a lot of direction. Um, I think I, you know, I kind of fell into that shiny object syndrome to a degree because, uh, you know, the more webinars I watched and the more meetings I went to, instead of providing clarity for me, it created confusion because it seemed like, and maybe, you know, it's my personality to some degree, but it seemed like whatever I heard last seemed like the smartest way to go and uh, something I should pursue. So, you know, wholesaling, you know, that seemed like a great thing. And of course, starting out, you know, what a shock. There wasn't a whole lot of people that were so anxious to sell me a house for 50 cents on the dollar. So then this whole notion of, well, you know, I can do lease option deals. And then that way, you know, you can give people basically full price. And so, you know, I did some of those deals and I've done some subject to deals and I've done some seller finance deals. And I was kind of, you know, all over the board trying to figure out what worked, what I liked, what seemed to fit my skill set more than anything. And at the end of the day, I kind of, I kind of fell back into the, and when I say wholesaling, I think that's what I was doing kind of initially. But in today's day, you know, and I talk to investors, I mean, frankly, whether you are a, a wholesaler or you are a fix and flip type of investor or you're an investor that's looking to, uh, you know, buy and hold properties, regardless of what you have or what you've done in the past, moving forward, you're not going to be any of those things without property acquisition. So I think now I kind of, my mindset is that I'm in the property acquisition business and depending on the property and depending on the circumstances is going to determine the exit strategy for that property. I also fell for a long time into the shiny object syndrome. I'm sure a lot of people are nodding their head right now, Dan, at going through <laughs> the shiny objects and the most recent webinar and the, you know, this guy sent his, his latest thing out. And for a long time, I would go on all those webinars and I stopped doing all that unsubscribe to all those, almost all of those lists out there. So as to cut the noise down and not even be tempted, I also uh, can, can relate to finally figuring out that the number one, you know, business that I'm in is a property acquisition business. And what, that was one of the reasons I wanted to get you on our show. We know each other from the networking events. I think we met at the ring meeting a couple of years ago here in Chicago. Sure. And, you know, we mm -hmm. meet a lot of people in the networking event areas, Dan, that never get past the shiny object syndrome, that their energy is going this way and that way, and they're doing lease options, all these different things, but never really hit the ground running uh, like you have had a chance to do. So, you figured out you were in a property acquisition business. What, you know, what are the numbers looking like today? How do you spend your day and what type of, you know, deals are you doing? What type of volume are you doing? I mean, how are you investing your time now that's different from Dan Clark and four, five, six, seven years ago when you weren't getting the same results? So as to help the person who maybe is still sitting there in some of that shiny object syndrome. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things is that, you know, first of all, if you're, you know, kind of determined that this is, you know, what you're going to do. And I, I think what turned the corner for myself is that I started adding up how much money I had spent on plane tickets and rental cars and hotel rooms and uh, boot camp, uh, you know, money. And uh, I paid some uh, money, I'm embarrassed to admit, on some coaching that was ill-advised at the time, you know, now, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. And I guess there's no such thing in life as bad experience uh, because, you know, everything you do kind of leads you to where you are now. So as painful as some of that is looking back, I mean, <clears throat> frankly, I think I probably would do it all over again because that's sometimes what it takes to get you moving. But I finally got to the point where I started putting a pencil to how much money I'd spent. And I kind of, you know, one day, I mean, I think like a lot of people, when this, maybe doesn't go as fast and easy as you were hoping, um, you know, it's easy to give up. And I kind of slammed my fist on the table one day and I go, that's it. I go, uh, you know, I don't know if I want to do this long term, but I've got about, uh, I don't know, 15, 18, 20,000 out the door. And I am not, I am not bailing out on this and taking a, you know, a, a $20,000 haircut. I go, I'm going to do whatever it is I have to do to make $20,000 in this business. And, you know, money's money. My time is free, but I'm going to make $20,000 somehow. And when I do, then I'll decide what I want to do moving forward. And I think, you know, simply making that decision in itself uh, kind of changed things. And believe it or not, that's, I think, when things actually started happening. I mean, my first, my first off-market property deal was a, a house that I bought for $9,000. And I was going to like, you know, a couple of these, you know, local uh, RIA kind of meetings. And, uh, you know, so I was all excited and called one of the guys in and said, hey, why don't you come take a look at this place? And he came out there and this particular house, um, you know, the foundation is on like piers, which it's really the only area around here. I don't know if they use those in other parts of the country, but, uh, this guy came out and he took a look at it, Dan, and he said, uh, Dan, he goes, I don't think this is a rehab. I think this is a, you know, a teardown, except the only problem is there's no teardowns in this neighborhood because if you tore down a house and built one, you couldn't sell it for how much it cost you to build it. So basically what he was saying is there's really no opportunity here at all. And you know, I think, again, that's one of the lessons because it would have been easy to say, oh, well, I guess this is no deal. But sometimes you just have to, you know, I think being in business for yourself is being a problem solver. And I'm like, man, I've got this contract. There's got to be a way to find a home for this. And this particular community is a lot of, you know, working class, blue collar kind of guys and families. I'm like, well, there's got to be somebody around here. So I just kind of put up some bandit signs around the area. And sure enough, I, I got a local guy that came over and I said, yeah, you know, we looked at the house and I said, you know, Take a look at this foundation. I don't know that much about it, but, you know, I get a sense that maybe, it, you know, it's not what it needs to be. And he kind of crawled there. I started laughing. He goes, I fix, I fix foundations for a living. This is a layup. I can, this is easy. I'll fix this. No problem. And so what went from one Saturday thinking, ah, oh, I finally found a property and it's not going to turn into anything. Uh, it did turn into a sale and uh, my first off market you know, property had a, pro a profit of $6,000. And I think the <laughs> thing that's so valuable about that check is that despite, you know, talking to people and knowing that people are doing this, I think it becomes real when you realize that you did it for yourself. And then at that point, you're kind of like a kid at the carnival where you get off that ride, and you go, I want to go on that ride again. <laughs> and then, just, you know, you go after it some more. Yeah, that's great. I have a similar story. Uh, my first check was also $6,000. I had a property under contract for 5500 and I didn't know how to do the comps back then. I looked and I saw that one of my friends had bought one like right around the corner for $6,000. So how I did my comps was I found his $6,000 sale a year or so before mine, and I thought, well, I'll just put 500 bucks on there for myself. Well, when I brought it to that guy with the one around the corner, it was on Remington Street, 
He said, dude, the reason they called it Remington Street is because of the Remington shell casings that are always on the front steps next to the chalk line when I go down there to collect my rent where the dead body was <laughs> from the shooting. And, I, and I'm like, oh, man, I don't want that. I'll give you mine for 5500 And I'm like, oh, God, what am I going to do now? It's the same thing. You know, I'm thinking I got a real dud on my hands. And my only mistake there, Dan, was not locking it up for 5500 because I ended up selling – mine for 11,500 about a week or two later and the same buyer that I sold mine to like 5 or 6 months later ended up buying my buddy's house for around the same 10 11,000 dollars that I was that I sold mine for so I left 6,000 dollars at least on the table by not pulling the trigger <laughs> on Remington but one of my you know it, it felt like a miracle as I'm sure yours did and a lot of people are looking for that miracle on the front end or remember that first deal that seemed like a miracle on the front end um, it, it really did. But looking back, something that I got, got a little lucky with is I had a newspaper ad running and I was starting to generate leads. It was my first successful lead generation system. Um, and mm -hmm. it does not work as well. I, I still have that ad running today. And I, I get like one or two calls per year off of, uh, three or four thousand dollars to keep the ad running. It's kind of a nostalgia thing for you. It's not generating a lot of leads, but it kind of, it's every time you get a call from that source, it just kind of reminds you of how it all started. That's cool. Yeah, I, I honestly forget about it until I talk about it. Like, now I might have to go cancel it after <laughs> we're done here. Today. Um, but uh, the, the point is, is that it used to be a really good lead source. And, like, looking back, if I didn't have a lead source, a place that was – you know, if I didn't figure out lead generation first, I never would have gotten to get up, like, you know, at bat. And, and in the living room in a negotiation to ever put that deal together. And I had like five or six leads that came in off of that one week ad. That's all I could afford back then. But then I kept that ad running once the $6,000 check came in and we would do a deal, two deals almost every single month out of that ad. It was fantastic. And you got to have leads coming in if you're going to do the wholesaling off market aspect of the business is kind of my, my lesson. You're doing it. Away. Yeah, and I think the thing is, because I was new and I didn't really know what I was doing on a bigger scale, um, you know, in, in those days when I was, you know, getting started in all this, I mean, in this market, you could probably go on the MLS on any day of the week and pick a general area and find yourself a nice fix and flip opportunity that you could buy right off the MLS. But, at the t you know, I didn't have money to do that. And I really didn't, you know, understand all the principles behind how to, you know, work a lot of those angles back then. So while most investors that were looking for buying holds and flips were MLS shopping, I was quietly behind the scenes working on my skill set of, um, you know, dealing with people and buying their houses so that now when the MLS has become a desert, uh, when people are looking for properties, um, the ability to find and contract off-market properties has become a pretty valuable skill. 100% agreed. Let's talk about that. 2018, the MLS is nearly impossible to get profitable deal from. Sure, I'm sure people stumble upon a few in certain areas and have plenty of evidence to the contrary, but not my experience at all, not your experience. So, Dan, what have you been doing in the first six months of 2018 now? What are are you still wholesaling? Are you doing fix and flips? Do you have a couple of rental properties, or do you only run the ATM rental business? Yeah, no, I you know, a little of all, right? So you know the ATM thing that keeps me busy a couple of days a week, and when I'm not doing that, it's uh, kind of a mix between uh, you know working on uh, off market property acquisition, uh, have a couple of of uh, you know flips. You know, one we just put on the market here last week. I have another one that I'm working on right now that I'm going to be holding as a rental. I do have several rental properties. I also uh, have two that uh, we're going to be closing on very shortly that are going to be uh, small flip jobs. So, uh, you know, I'm still not, you know, completely zeroed in on this is the only thing I do. But I would say in this market, uh, not so many wholesale deals. I mean, I run into people and they go, hey, Dan, man, like, you're still, you know, like, you're still wholesaling, right? And I go, well, yeah. They go, well, you know, you haven't really sent anything out on your list lately. And I start laughing. I go, well, <laughs> I don't because, you know, frankly, you're not really uh, willing to pay what, um, what I think I can get for finding these properties. 
So, I mean, I know this is a strategy that, you know, probably a lot of people are doing based on the uh, lack of MLS inventory, but so many times we find a really nice deal and, uh, you know, we just, you know, we just find a way to close on it and turn around and relist it uh, because at the end of the day, the MLS always will bring the most money just the way it is, you know? So, I mean, in this market for me anyways, the only possible reason not to, um, you know, quote, wholesale it like that is either because there just isn't enough spread to make it worth doing or B, you just can't uh, come up with uh, private money or whatever it's going to take to bring, you know, to take the deal down on the front end. Because, you know, I mean, one of the measures that so many people talk about in this business is, uh, you know, how many deals are you doing? How many a month? How many a year? And, I don't know, may, you know, I mean, that's a certainly a valuable measurement, I guess, but I try to measure a little more by how much money do you make? I mean, running around, I mean, the thing I find about these off-market properties, for myself anyways, is, you know, it's, I mean, I'm not a big golfer, but, you know, I understand it. And it's a lot like swinging a golf club. You know, it's the, you have one swing and the ball goes farther with a three iron than it does with a nine iron but it's essentially the same swing and i guess what i mean by that is that the the marketing the call intake the property evaluation the meeting with sellers and and all the complexity that comes with trying to get the deal closed that's the same complexity whether there's going to be a twenty five hundred or three thousand dollar assignment fee or a sixty thousand dollar win and so if it's going to be the same amount of work all the way around, I, you know, I don't want to say that I can't be bothered with small deals, but I've just found that, you know, over over some time here, there's been a pretty good run of properties with net profits that uh, most of America would like to see uh, as a yearly uh, salary. So I, I guess maybe we'll just spend a little more time on the uh, highest profitable deals that we can find, I guess is what I'd say. Yeah, you really hit the nail on the head. And this is a story that I'm starting to hear more and more. And it's the story that, you know, over the last 12 months, uh, us at Diamond Equity Investments have also been telling and living as well. And it's like, I, I've got a lot of private investors who approach me through the podcast, through the networking events, people that I just know who have some money, family members, etc., and and really uh, started to just close on everything that comes across the plate now. And I get the same thing. I mean, we're still sending quite a few deals out to our lists anyway, but a lot of these deals don't ever make it to the list. And a lot of those deals, it's the same kind of thing. I probably would have assigned those for 10 to 20 percent of the profit that we're making now. And we are rehabbing. We're doing rehabs in every market that we're in. We're doing uh, you know, a lot of paint and carpet cleanup stuff. We're just going to, you know, go in, clean the property out, kind of get it livable, presentable, and then let the buyer decide to put the kitchen in or anything. And the philosophy, the paradigm shift that you nailed on the head, Dan, was, you know, everyone's saying, oh, how many deals, how many deals, how many deals are you doing as that metric, as opposed to how much money being the right question to ask. And it's like, I guess, you know, uh, I don't remember if it was this year. I think it may have been the beginning of last year, but I made a conscious decision to do higher quality deals. Um, we would be trying to fight. You know, those $2,000, $3,000 assignments would be like the ones say like, they were the hardest to sell. You know, we had to do the most showings to get someone because we maybe contracted the property a little bit higher than we should have. And we're like beg borrowing and, and like stealing to get two thousand dollar assignment on something where you know you got these the, the quality deals that someone will give you twenty thousand dollars in a heartbeat on an assignment. Instead, you close it out, you turn it around, maybe you do some work, maybe not, but you end up with a fifty or a sixty thousand uh, dollar net profit after all your expenses. Like you know, I got to make sure that you know my eyes are open to the quality deal as opposed to. Uh, the quantity. I think too, Dan, you know, that was 2011. You got in, it's like seven years. I got in in 2006. It probably took me like 10 to 11 years before I finally started to adjust my site, be good at negotiating and be aware of putting together these deals with these larger 
prophets attached to them. It was almost like I didn't believe they were possible or my awareness just wasn't in tune to those, you know, higher quality deals with forty, fifty thousand dollars spreads on them. I just was wasn't seeing it when I was in the living room. I just couldn't seem to put it together. I mean, I'll get lucky on a few and make some money, but not like, you know, like you just said, oh, they seem to be coming around. I was like, are they coming around or did I start to just become aware, you know, that these deals are coming across my plate? Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, you're right on it. I mean, you know, I mean, sometimes we fall into this trap where, you know, we try to be deal makers, but at the end of the day, better maybe to be focused on being a deal finder because it seems like, I don't know, this is some advice my father gave me some years ago, but you know those, I mean, I think we've all had those moments where whether it be some particular kind of car or some kind of thing you want to buy and you know, it seems like the more time you need to spend to try to, quote, talk yourself into it, that's usually probably an indication it's something you shouldn't be doing, right? And, you know, I mean, I think sometimes, um, you know, particularly when I was new, every phone call that would come in, I'm like scratching my head going, how how is this possibly a deal? And the realization is it's not. And, you know, for any of the newer people out there, you know, you just have to know on the front end that, you know, almost all the calls you're going to generate aren't really going to go anywhere. But the ones that do, you know, I mean, at least my experience early on was like, and I'm dating myself when I give this example, but in the movie, The Blues Brothers, when John Belushi is standing at the back of that church and that beam of light is shining right on him, uh, you know, when the right call comes, it's like, this is exactly the call I've been waiting for. They say all the right things. They're ready to move. To have a situation, how soon can you come out, and everything just kind of falls in line. And I guess that's the thing, uh, you know, when I say so many of the calls are, you know, tire kickers and retail and all the other things, I think what keeps me excited about all the calls is that, and I don't play it, but I, you know, I see them in the locations where I'm servicing ATM machines, but it's it's almost like scratch off lottery tickets. It's you know, scratch, loser, scratch, loser, scratch, loser, scratch, loser, boom, finally a winner. And that's kind of how it is with the, with the phone. Every time the phone rings, you go, it's probably a loser, but this could be the next $100,000 profit on this call. And that's what gets exciting. So, Dan, I want to switch gears a little bit. You're buying these rental properties. What's your philosophy behind what you're buying? Why are you buying them? How do you choose the deals you want to keep as rental? Is it a cash flow thing? Is it a neighborhood thing, a school district thing? I like to have my guests talk about their reasoning behind why they're collecting this basket of rental properties to kind of help other people who maybe didn't buy any yet or have no direction on their rental property purchase to help like identify the traits that are successful that people hold as like important reasoning why they're buying them so that maybe they could buy better properties on the next one or better properties than they would have if they didn't hear your experience and how you've modified and evolved your buying strategy since you bought your first rental property. So because I live, you know, so far out in the Northwest suburban area of Chicago, most of the, you know, marketing effort and uh, areas that, you know, we're working are out in this area. And, you know, I know there's an awful lot of opportunity. I know the, you know, the numbers make sense. And I know there's a lot of activity in a lot of these uh, neighborhoods on the south side. And frankly, I just, I don't go there. I don't want to go there. I don't want to own down there. I don't want to deal with it. the complexities and the challenges of those kind of markets. Uh, you know, maybe that's an, an age thing. I'm 55 and I, I just don't have the patience to put up with that nonsense at this stage of my life. So I try to find some of the areas closer to home that the numbers are favorable, that are solid communities that, um, you know, that I can keep an eye on because I mean, I think, you know, it's like anything. There's that middle, there's that middle ground, which is where I probably am. So I'm not a complete newbie. I'm doing a variety of things. I'm making decent money doing what I'm doing. I'm having fun doing it, but I'm not so big and so, you know, full of cash that I'm taking on other markets and having project managers do everything and property management people doing everything. So I'm still kind of, you know, bootstrapping it on a lot of those things. So, 
you know, running, you know, I mean, I've got this property, uh, you know, right down the street in Elgin from me here. And, you know, I'm over there several times a week showing my face. Where are we at? What are we doing? I'm at, you know, I just left uh, the box store last week with, uh, I don't know, about $4,000 worth of supplies, uh, you know, being that were delivered last week to, uh, you know, keep the teams uh, working. And all those things take time. And so I guess, you know, what I'm trying to get to is that I think the sooner you can get to a point where you can have some other people doing things instead of you is obviously better, mostly for the same reason. And probably, you know, the prime, a prime example of this is for, you know, the whole bandit sign side of the business. Uh, our business, we still uh, utilize that marketing strategy. That's what I call the now money. You know, the, the mail, the mail campaigns are the, uh, maybe money and sometimes the later money, but it seems like, uh, you know, I've had calls in the past. I mean, I literally get a call at 9.30 in the morning from a bandit sign, and by 12.30, I'm at the property, and by 2.30, there's a contract. Like, that doesn't happen so often on mail campaigns for me anyways, but the whole thing about putting them out, um, you know, as the saying goes, you can't be a six-figure earner doing minimum wage work. So, I mean, I think the sooner you can, uh, you know, and again, same thing. I think for everybody, we have to, you know, spend your time on the most valuable activities. And I think one of the biggest shifts when you become a, you know, an entrepreneur and you no longer are tied to a W-2 job and a company and a boss is that you quickly realize that time is your most valuable resource. And I think it might be one of the reasons why, you know, when you're host, hosting the podcast, you're you're thankful to your guests for taking the time because, you know, in this business, you know, your time is everything. When you have a job, you know, the, sitting around and doing fantasy sports and working your NCAA bracket and talking to your buddies from college and uh, sitting around in the office, that's a whole different thing than when you're doing this stuff for yourself. Don't you find that to be true? Yeah, absolutely. I, I like to, to coin the term profitable time. How can I see profitable time? You know, where am I using time? Like you said, that minimum wage thing, that's not necessarily the best. Which of my rental properties are taking too much time to manage? Like I'll sell them and break even or even lose money if I need to to get out because I can – you know, find a more profitable place for that time to be invested. And I think a lot of people, you know, just like you mentioned early on our episode here, Dan, you said that, you know, you had all the time in the world and you, you know, you needed to make the $20,000 or whatever it was to kind of like move forward and make it happen and find that, you know, go to. And you said that, you, you, you know, you had all the time in the world, but you had to figure out the money. But then later on, you start making the money and you got to figure out, what's the best allocation of this time in order to get, you know, the return on that time invested. Um, you mentioned in your rental portfolio that the numbers were favorable. Can you define exactly what favorable numbers would be for you on a rental property that you're going to keep? Maybe even the one that you have under contract or uh, I think you have under construction right now. So in a perfect world and, you know, in a lot of markets, it's getting harder to do this, but when possible, I like to find a property that I can buy, that I can, um, you know, put it all back together. And because I plan on holding these longer term, uh, I tend to, you know, go the distance in terms of putting a roof and a furnace and a water heater and new appliances and all the, you know, the things that are going to cost me money down the road. I like to get these properties situated so that theoretically I'm not going to have any big headaches coming in the next 10 years. And then I like to try to get them refinanced in such a way that I have no money left in the deal. So if I can do that, you know, that's what I'm looking to do. And, or I'm looking for, you know, probably in the neighborhood of $400 a month cash flow. I mean, I know, you know, people do things and they get a hundred dollars a month cash flow. And sometimes that's more of a, an appreciation play and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I like, I like, you know, appreciation down the road. That's a bonus. I, I like to know that starting on day one, this property is going to produce three seventy five, four hundred dollars And, you know, if it's more, so be it. But, and then the other thing I do, and, and sometimes I, you know, I've had the opportunity where, 
Uh, I mean, I had a property that by some miracle, I like literally bought this thing for $25,000 and I redid the thing completely top to bottom. I was all in for 90. It was appraised for 160. They would have refied it, uh, you know, like 120 or something. And rather than do that and pull money out, I opted to just do the loan for the 90 that I needed to make myself whole and pay back my private you know, money person in an effort to keep the payment lower and the cash flow higher. That's, you know, that's not right or wrong. It's just, you know, kind of how I do it. It's pretty smart. How many of those $400 give or take rentals have you been able to collect in? Not as many as I'd like. Uh, I've kind of made a shift. Uh, <laughs> like I told you the first, the first three properties I told you that I bought that I didn't live in were actually down in Ocean Springs, uh, Mississippi on the Gulf Coast. And since that time, I, I picked up a couple of uh, condos close to home. And now I'm working on my third single family house. So I guess all in, I have maybe, I don't know, nine or 10 properties. Nice. I remember one of the big shiny objects for me. We went to the same kind of get rich in real estate seminar. It sort of worked. They taught us this plethora of strategies and you know everywhere you would go in the real estate business you would hear that you'd have to buy rental properties to be financially free and i always was trying to get those properties too early i felt like you know for me i didn't come from corporate america there was no fat six-figure job uh, i didn't have anything to fall back on uh but i really encourage at least people that i know to focus on you know, figuring out how to make a six-figure business out of the real estate thing, if it's real estate that you're really counting on for your, your bread and butter, figure out how to make that six-figure opportunity. Figure out the lessons, the marketing, the working, the acquisition, the fixing and flipping properties, the wholesale and whatever it is, but figure out how to build a business that produces enough income that you can afford to own rental properties. My rental properties need maintenance, you need you need to have good income on your tax return for a few years. And, uh, you know, there's rental properties can cost money. If one goes vacant, you have to do an eviction. You have to foot the bill for those um, payments that you're making. Oh, yeah. And at the at the end of the year, you may not make any money for the first couple of years. And I had some mentors and friends in the business, partners in the business who taught me that same thing. And I didn't want to hear it. You know, I was this young 30-year-old kid thinking that, like, if only I had 10 rental properties, I'd be, you know, set for life. But you have to be prepared for that stuff. You have to have the income to offset that. The rental properties have not really been. It's more of a savings account for me. It's like something for the future that maybe I'll sell those houses at some point and cash out the money. But I'm I'm definitely not living off of the properties, uh, my rental property income by any means. And I, I wish I would have had more patience with that earlier in my career so that I would have stayed focused and there were a handful of deals I did that were marginal because I thought they were going to be better cash flow and I thought they were going to be rental properties and uh, obviously don't do bad deals. But I probably, if I had the sites clearer earlier on, wouldn't have wasted the time, energy, attention and money on those marginal deals and could have continued to develop the focus for the better deals. So, Dan, if you could go back and share the crown jewel of wisdom with yourself right when you were getting started in 2011, maybe when you just left that Get Motivated seminar, what would that be? I think I would just remind myself that, you know, I have skills, I have ability, and I have to believe in myself. If you don't have the quote Jerry Maguire in your life, you should try to be that for somebody else because I think that's so important. I mean, I got to tell you, my wife has been a rock through this whole thing. And she's, you know, there was times when I was, you know, getting down and get, she and every day she go, you're doing great. I go, I don't know what your definition of great is. Where I come from, great, uh, you know, a bunch of work <laughs> ends with a sizable paycheck. And she goes, forget about that. You're doing the right stuff. You know, it's all coming. Just keep doing what you're doing. I believe in you. You're you're going to be great. And having that person, uh, you know, pumping you up even when you know that it's not real, it goes a long way. So if, you know, I try to find a way to be that person for other people. And just, you just have to know that anything in life is possible. And you just have to determine what it is you want. I mean, I think maybe the best illustration and, and you know, I got to get better at this for myself, frankly, but you know, when those Garmin's and now everyone's got, you know, the GPS stuff on their phone and that, but 
the reality is that technology uh, on the surface is absolutely useless. I mean, let's face it. I don't need to put on my phone in the mapping feature to know where I am. I already know where I am. So the only value and benefit that I see in it is that I have to actually put in a destination because once I decide where it is I want to go, now it'll give me two or three routes to get there. And I think maybe, you know, to my younger self, I would have spent more time and more discernment trying to figure out exactly the destination that I wanted. Because if you can get clear on where you want to go, I think it just gets easier uh, to find the path to get you there. Well said. Great advice there. Uh, Dan, how can people get more information about you? Do you have contact info, company, or website you'd like to share? Sure. They can email me at Keep It Simple. I got, you know, like many of us, we have 50, we got all sorts of email addresses. But uh, for the simple fact, it's just my name, Dan Clarton, C-L-A-R-T-O-N, at gmail.com. You can call me at 847-910-0454. You know, I mean, we talked about so many things. We didn't even mention the fact they started a title company a year ago to kind of, that's a kind of, that's a whole different conversation, of course, because that's kind of Chicago specific. And, and the way we close deals here, I don't think are, is really the way it goes on in a lot of other markets around the country. So that's probably not a good conversation for a, a national audience. But, uh, you know, again, it just goes to, you know, always looking for opportunities to grow and, uh, lend service to others. Absolutely. So if anyone does live in the Chicago area and is an investor, uh, Dan's title company can help you out with that. It will be worth picking up the phone and giving them a call or shooting him an email. That does not apply if you're outside of the state of Illinois. Hey, Dan, thank you for coming on the show. I know you've got to get on the road and tend to your businesses. Um, I really appreciate you taking your time. I'm sure the guests also appreciate you taking your time to come out and be on the REI Diamond Show. Absolutely, Dan. Listen, I really appreciate the opportunity. It's it's you know it's good to talk about you know what we're doing, and sometimes even by talking it through, it kind of you know brings you know the rest of the day. I'll be thinking about this conversation, probably some things I should be tightening up in my business. So great great time uh, to spend with you today, and really enjoyed myself. And thank you, my loyal listener, for checking out this episode of the REI Diamond Show. If you're interested in checking out the next episode pre-release before the email goes out, please subscribe on YouTube or one of the podcasting apps, including iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher for early notifications. During this episode, I mentioned our networking group, the Chicago Ring Meeting. If you are local to Chicago or will be visiting and might want to check out an upcoming meeting, go to chicagoring.com to check out the schedule of events and sign up for notifications. If you have investment capital on the sidelines, not already earning above average returns, you should check out superchargedreturns.com. When you enter your email address there, I'll send you an email when the next upcoming private mortgage investment opportunity becomes available in either Chicago, Atlanta, Florida, or Philadelphia, where we operate our fix and flip projects, as well as some short-term, exciting, 90 days or less return of capital hotel deals. Again, that site is superchargedreturns.com. And finally, if you have certain questions or topics you'd like discussed on a future episode or maybe a guest suggestion, somebody that you'd like me to invite on the show or just want to contact me, you can do so by clicking the contact and link at reidiamonds.com. And you can also find links to check out our profitable real estate investment deals that are available at that site. R-E-I diamonds.com. Thank you once again for being a loyal listener of the REI Diamond Show. Dan Breslin here. I'll catch you on the next episode. Thank you for listening to this episode of the REI Diamonds Show with Dan Breslin. To receive email notifications of new weekly episodes, sign up at www.reidiamonds.com.